Hey everybody, how you doing out there? My name is Michelle, welcome to my channel. And if you're new here, just know that we are all about gardening. It is raining, drizzly, and cold outside. But today I thought I would talk about perennials, specifically perennial combinations to put in the garden. How many of you have ever wondered like how to put the stuff together in the garden to make it look good? So I thought I'd cover two designs that I created a couple years ago for customers that I have and show you how I put them together, uh, what kind of conditions they're under, and they all can be adapted to different situations as well. So I thought we would cover that. So come on, let's go take a look. So one of the things I decided to do was create a series of different landscaping projects that maybe would help people out there apply how to put different things together in their beds at home. Now, I am in zone 5B, which is in Illinois, and we just got reclassified as 5B, so I have a tendency to still plant like 4B, 5A, uh, until I know whether or not that 5B is gonna hold true. But all of the plants that I'm going to use today pretty much are in the range of zone three through seven for sure. Some of them are two through eight and three through eight. So a pretty good variety as far as what you can plant in the different zones. Now the two designs I am gonna show you are planted on east facing uh, areas of the property of where I did them. So they're getting a lot of morning sun. One of them is up against a house and so it gets morning sun until about noon, which is great for everything that we put into that bed. And the other one is a little further out from the house till about noon and maybe one o'clock. And then the sun is over the top of the house and the further the sun goes over the house, the more the shade comes through and shades this. Now, one of these is a side bed along the side of the house and the other one is along a driveway that's pulled out a little bit. So you could actually take the designs though and stretch them out, make them smaller, add more, add less. It's really the combination of the perennials and I have some shrubs and trees in there too that you can use uh, that I think look really good together. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first one and I'll walk you through what's in it and then we'll go over each individual plant. This one I did two or three years ago and this is where a an area of the lawn slopes down and so we did put the outcropping in there but you could certainly do this in a tiered wall. You could elongate this one out so that it stretches along the side of a bed. You could put it in a little corner pocket at your house and just the way it's set up is it layers down. So in the back, and I'm gonna go over each individual uh, perennial one by one, and then I will show you like what they are, I guess at the end with little arrows and stuff. So this one has got basically one, two, three, four, five plants, that's it, five plants in it. And I think they're super easy to grow. They're very low maintenance when it comes time to do maintenance on them. Uh, basically, you're going to be cutting the perennials and the grasses back. You're going to head back, which means cutting off the top one third of the hydrangeas uh, one time a year, whether you do it in the fall or early spring. And then the pine that I have in there, you don't do anything to. So let's talk about each individual plant. This first one is a May night salvia. This was one of the plants that I covered in my uh, video perennial plants for the garden that I just put out a couple days ago. It was the 1997 perennial plant of the year, so it's really a great plant to use. This one is gonna go and grow in zone three through eight, and I love it because it's deer resistant, rabbit resistant. It has a nice height to it, growing 15 to 18 inches high and wide. It is a full sun plant, and so full sun means you wanna get at least six to eight hours, and positioned where this is in the bed, it's absolutely getting that. It blooms in June, and if you cut back the flowers when they're done blooming, it will push out new flowers. So this this is a great kind of middle of the border bed or if your bed's not really wide, it's one of those uh, flowers that you could put towards the back if you just have maybe one layer uh, next to it. So I love this one. I think it's really pretty. It's got a really dark flower on it. It grows really well. It's a great pollinator, pollinator attractor and I've used it for years and had great success with it. So this is the one that is in the back middle of the bed. Now this next one that we used is a bobo hydrangea. It grows in zone three through eight. It is a smaller hydrangea, so it's only gonna get about three feet high and four feet wide. So it's the perfect size to tuck in here. It doesn't take over the bed, but it's got these beautiful blooms on it. And what I like about the bobo, and I've grown them before, is the flowers start white, then they start to age to pink. But what's really nice about a bobo is, I'm telling you, head to toe, this thing is full of flowers. It doesn't bloom as early as some of the other ones. It's a little bit later. I find here in Northern Illinois, I don't start to see my flowers until about 
the third or fourth week in July. But then once it starts to put on those flowers, it puts on this spectacular show-stopping show all the way until the frost. Now, this is going to um, be the specimen plant and the main focal piece in the bed. And in this particular design, we planted two, one on either side. So if you were going to put this in a long bed, I would anchor these on either side of the bed and kind of like do a mirror where those are on the end and then another plant and then you kind of come to the middle and then the salvia would be in the middle. But if you want to make it like in a tiered bed down a wall, I would kind of place it like I have in the design that I'm showing you right now. Oh, and if I didn't say it, those hydrangeas are by Proven Winner. Now this next one that we're going to look at, this is a Nepeta, a Cat's Meow. Now I know the Cat's Pajama has been out there. I think it was their plant of the year last year for Proven Winners. I actually like the Cat's Meow. It's a little bit bigger. And so this grows in zone three through eight. It's deer and rabbit resistant. It's one of the earliest bloomers that you're going to get. And what I do find with it is you can let it go and just have it grow all summer. But what happens is like the outside flowers on it like fall open and then you'll get new growth that comes out the center it actually will look better is after it's done with that first flush of blooms like the end of june beginning of july you shear it back and you i'm not kidding you cut it like that far from the ground it'll reflush rebloom and look so much better for the rest of the year it looks a little sloppy if it if you don't do that which i mean i've done that where i've left it up all year because Sometimes I'm really hesitant to cut it back because the pollinators are all over it and they love it. But if this is something that I'm putting in the front of my house, maybe I want it to be a little bit neater. Mine's in the back, so I'm like, yeah, whatever. I don't care if it looks messy. But it does look better if you share it back. This one is going to um, grow in zone three through eight. I don't know if I already said that. And again, this is also a proven winner uh, cultivar. And it is one of the earliest blooming ones in the spring. So you're going to get your flowers, at least here like in zone five, I start to see the flowers on this mid-May, and it blooms all the way until a frost takes it out. So really good, sturdy, hardy uh, perennial, and I really love, this is a different color purple than the May night. So you've got that dark, dark violet, and then this one is more like a lavender. So the two together look really good. So here in Northern Illinois, we have winter. So we need winter interest in our beds as well. So not only do we have the structure of the hydrangeas, we have this beautiful Mugo pine that we're gonna talk about next and the outcropping that's in there. So what I love about this Mugo pine is that it is super small, super slow growing, and it won't take over. And it's only going to get 12 to 24 inches high. So that's not very big and maybe three feet wide and it's going to take it 10 years to do that so it's got this beautiful mounding habit to it and then it gets those little candles on it in the spring i love this one because it has that nice beautiful green color and it's deer resistant i don't have to prune it it's drought tolerant once you get it established and it just gives you this nice anchor in your bed so i really like this one it'll take a little bit of shade but it does better in full sun and I don't know. I really like this shrub. Now, I like the big ones too, but you better have a lot of room for it. This one is called a slow mound, and it's one of my favorite ones to use. So, And they're very easy to find. So you should be able to find this if you uh, want to plant one of these. You should be able to find it very, very easily. Okay, so the last thing I used in the bed was a penstemon, and this is the hamlin. Now, if you want a smaller grass, you could use a piglet, or if you want one even smaller than that, you could use a little bunny, depending on your circumstances and like what height you want the grass to be. I love this grass. It's I have them at my house, and I use them in landscaping. This is the largest of the series. This is the hamlin, growing two to three feet high, and then the plumes come up um, above it, so it's probably another eight inches above that. Um, they are deer resistant, full sun, and I like the movement that they give you in the bed. Now in this garden design, I used three at the bottom and two at the top. So I ended up using five. And I don't think I said, but on the net, but I used three. And so I like the movement of this. Now this one here, it can self seed. So I always recommend to my customers to cut them down in the fall and not leave them up. They're not the greatest grass when heavy snow gets on them. They kind of just flop over and then they look messy for the rest of the year. So on these, I would probably take them down. They are a warm season grass, so they don't start to grow until the ground warms up. Then they're going to grow through the heat of the summer. They get their little bunny plumes on them. Aren't those so cute? They get those more towards the end of August, beginning of September. And they don't really get any big spectacular color, 
but they are really nice in the bed and give you that nice movement in there. So this bed has a really super long bloom time and everything in it is really super low maintenance and my customer needed that and I bet you most of you want that too. So this is one that I did that I really super like and I thought I would share it with you because I think it's versatile and you can just use it in a lot of applications. There you go. Those are all the different components in the bed. And as I said before, I used three of the little of the ham ones on the bottom, two at the top, three Salvia May Night, two Bobos, one Moogle Pine, and three Nepeta Cats Meow. So there you go. If you want to try this one, go for it. So let's talk about the next one I did. All right, this next one I did is a powerful, colorful, just really in your face bright. This guy had red brick and it was a man that I did this for. And he wanted something with a lot of punch and a lot of wow. So we went with a lot of bold colors and we did put a little bit of that dark purple in there. But this has got the reds and the oranges. And even though you can see in the background of this, the red flowers, those are daylilies and they're the Chicago Apache and they're already there. And I wasn't designing towards the back of the house, but I wanted to tie in the red brick and those flowers with the bed as you came around the corner. So this is a condo. So he had to get all of his impact in like this side of the, of the house because the driveway light came right up and there wasn't really a front bed. So we put all of our impact and all of our love right here. And we ended up installing this, I want to say maybe five years ago, and I don't know if he still lives there or not anymore. I've lost contact with him, uh, but maybe this summer I can drive by and see how this one looks. But for now, let's take a look at what we put in it. Right, the first one that I put in was a different salvia than the May Night. This was actually the Violet Profusion, and I love that I keep all my designs and all of my uh, lists of everything that I put in people's landscaping so that if years down the road they call me and they lost their book that I gave them and their tags, I can tell them exactly what it is that they have. Uh, and so I recommend that you do that too. Even if you just have a drawer where you throw them all in. I always have like these little envelopes I put them in, like the manila envelopes, and I'll write down what bed it is and I just shove all the tags in it and I have them in a drawer in my house. That way I know what I planted. Um, and oh, I did, for those of you who have been following along, I did find the tag for the rose in the cottage garden, which I'll go over the next time we tour. I found it in a drawer in my envelope. So I was really glad I did that. I thought I hadn't done that, but I did. So that's why you do that. All right. So back to the salvia. This is Violet Profusion. It's from Proven Winners. It is a shorter cultivar. It's only 16 inches tall and it gets about 20 inches wide, but it behaves like every other salvia out there. It wants full sun pollinator magnet, deer resistant. This one is salt tolerant. And because this is kind of towards the edge of the drive and because he lives in a condo, I know there's going to be salt. So I wanted to place something there that can handle that. Also something that he could cut back. So if they pile snow there, it will come back every year. So this one does the trick for us. The other thing is this, because it's uh, salvia, again, you have to cut the flowers back after it's done blooming to get it to reflush. Now, if you don't do that, this one, what I like about it is when the flowers are all done, that little calyx that comes up, it kind of stays purple. So it doesn't look totally like trashed and bad. If you don't do that or never get around to that, it just will have a purple calyx on it and no purple flowers. And I don't know if he'll cut them back or not, but that was the other reason I chose this flower because it is super low maintenance and it's really pretty, but they bloom more towards like the beginning of the summer, end of spring, and that's where they're going to bloom. The next one that I have is a Japanese maple. Now I want to clarify that here in zone five, Japanese maples have to be put kind of on a protected area. They can't be planted on the northwest side of our houses. They need to have a little bit of protection from afternoon sun, and they have to be protected from the winter storms, or they'll croak every single time. They also won't grow in heavy clay, and this guy had pretty good dirt. We did amend it when we put the bed in so that we gave everything the best chance possible that it would have to grow, and we amended it with just a regular garden uh, waste compost that we bring in that's organically certified, and that's what we we would use to amend all of our beds with. So this is an, or an Orangeola Japanese maple, and I like this one because it's got that beautiful orange foliage. It also only grows three to five feet high, so it's really short and it gets kind of wide. So it makes you think of like a bush. And if you prune out bottom branches, you can open it up a little bit, but if you never do anything to it, it still looks awesome. And it has this beautiful, beautiful color. Grows in zone three through eight. 
It is deer resistant, although some people have told me that they've seen their deer nibbling on their Japanese maples. They're supposed to be deer resistant. I can't attest to that one way or the other because I don't know. Um, this one we put in and it, I know for the first couple years there was no issues whatsoever. The other thing is Japanese maples do better with morning sun and if you can protect them with from the hot afternoon sun, it's so much better. This is on the east side of the house and it is more protected here. So he lives in a little cul-de-sac of the condo association. So he's got some things that are giving him some wind breaks that I know that this did very well in that area. So for us here in zone five, we have to really think about where we're gonna put a Japanese maple, but if you can get one, they are definitely a focal point accent piece, totally awesome in the garden. I mean, you have to kind of shop around for them because they can get pricey and the bigger they are, the more pricey they are. But just know if you start off with a small one, that's okay. They will grow. They're just slow growers. Um, if you have the patience and the time, go for it. So Japanese maple orangeola. The next shrub I put in is from Proven Winners and it's from the Sunjoy collection. This is the mini maroon barberry and I chose this one because it gets three by three and I didn't want a great big one. I also wanted one that had sterile seeds. Now I know in some areas barberries are not allowed. We can grow them here in Illinois, but I like to use the Proven Winter ones because they are sterile seeds and they don't spread all over the place. I like this one because it's no prune. It has beautiful color to it. It fit my color scheme. Um, he doesn't have to prune them. That was the reason I chose it. It grows in zone three through eight. It's deer and rabbit resistant, and it's gonna grow in full sun. Now it will take a little bit of shade, but just know the more shade you get it, the less vibrant the color is going to be on it. And it can revert like to a green almost if it doesn't get any sun. I had some at my other house that I tried to grow in the shade and they started off red and they would revert to green. And eventually after like three or four years, I started losing them. So they really do need sun. Okay, so the guy that I did this for was an older gentleman and he wanted to piddle just a little bit, but he wanted most of his stuff to be pretty low maintenance. So I chose a bird's nest spruce, which is also very low maintenance. I love these because they're kind of round and flat on the top and they don't require any pruning. In the spring, they get these beautiful, beautiful green um, needles that come out and it just looks absolutely gorgeous. It's nice and soft too. They are slow growers and they take a long time to get as big as they get, uh, three to five feet high and four to five feet wide. But I needed a nice anchor piece in the back of the bed that was gonna like end the bed and transition it as it went around the corner. It'll take it a while to get that big, but these are absolutely beautiful. Zone two through eight, so they're super hardy as far as how much cold they can tolerate. And they will take a little bit of uh, part shade. I have these growing at my house and they're growing only in like six hours of sun and they're doing great. And then I have some that are in full blasting sun over at the garden center and they're doing great too. So I love this shrub. No prune. Gotta love that. All right, moving on to the next one. All right, I don't see a lot of people plant with blanket flowers, but I really like blanket flowers. Um, they're not deer resistant, but if you don't have deer pressure, maybe this would be one to try. I like these flowers when they're blooming and I like these flowers when they're not blooming because the little billy ball that's on there after the petals fall off still looks good all the time. Now you can deadhead these and these will continue to bloom pretty much all summer long. And they'll be in between the stage of like bud, bloom, and then the spent ones, which have the billy balls. And I just like the way they look. I think it's so happy looking and it's very bright and cheerful. It kind of has that daisy look, but not that daisy look. So I really like these. They're gonna grow, this cultivar that I chose was the Arizona Sun. Now there's other ones that grow higher as well. Because this was at the front of the border, I wanted something a little bit shorter. That was why I chose this one. T only 10 to 12 inches high and 12 to 14 inches wide, full sun, zone three through eight. So if you're looking for a bright pop, maybe a blanket flower is for you. Last but not least, I put a nice focal piece at the end. We used a weeping Norway spruce, but you could use any kind of weeper that you like. You could use a weeping larch or a weeping hemlock, whatever one you like. 
uh, I chose a prostate one. And what that means is basically instead of growing it up and then having it fall over, they bend it earlier so that it starts to grow more prostate towards the ground and it gets wide. And so I like those because they don't get so tall. Now this one, it might, I don't know, everyone's different. So it might get eight or 10 feet tall, maybe, maybe only six. It, every one of a we every one of the Norway weepers, they are all different based on the conditions it's growing under, when it was bent. I mean, just, it just, they all grow different. So Typically, though, they're going to get probably eight feet wide. So this one's going to grow wide and out. And we have a piece of outcropping there that it's kind of weeping over. Zone two through eight, great cold hardiness. I find that they're drought tolerant once you get them in the ground and get them established. The only thing is if you have deer pressure, they can come and nibble on these. But I've never seen them eat these down to nothing. I've seen them like nibble. Um, so just know that about these, but I love a weeping spruce. Give me one. I'm putting it in a garden bed because I love them. They won't grow great in heavy clay. No spruces do. They have to have amended soil and great drainage. So just know that with both the bird's nest spruce and this spruce, they need that. So there you go. Overall, I ended up using three of the Salvia Violet Profusion. I used one Japanese maple. I used three of the mini maroon Sunjoy Barberries. I used three Gallardias, but you could probably use five or seven if you have enough room. You could stretch that out and put in more. We used one Bird's Nest Spruce and one Weeping Norway Spruce. So we really used the perennials to kind of tie all the colors together. And it's just a great way to have all of the different colors and elements that you're looking for. We did put a piece of outcropping at the end and two fractured boulders underneath the Japanese maple. Now the difference between a like round granite boulder, which if you have one of those, go ahead and use it if it's pretty, and a fractured boulder is a fractured boulder is like you took a chisel to the side of the mountain and you chiseled off some rock and it fell off and it fractured and it looks different. Every rock is different. Their colors are different. There's black ones, blue ones. Some of them have the veining running through them. I love fractured boulders because they have such great personality and they can really add a focal piece or an impact piece or something to create uh, different pieces of the garden around. So I like to use them. And in this case, I used them here underneath the Japanese maple and you can use them too or not. You don't have to use them. Uh, I just, I just like to. So there you go. There's two designs. Hopefully that will help you be a little creative in the garden. All right, you guys, there you go. Two ways to use perennials, two designs that I hope maybe will help you or inspire you to go out and garden or create a garden this spring or this summer. I know that I have more gardens going in this year, so I'm excited about that. The next uh, couple weeks, we'll be doing some mixed videos watch for some more perennial pairing videos because one of the things that I do want to do is I want to think about how can I teach it to you guys if you knew nothing I think sometimes we take it for granted that you know what we're talking about but you really don't so I want to make sure that I give you information that will help you be better gardeners inspire you to go create gardens and if you're an advanced gardener still maybe you'll learn something too so I want to take it down to uh okay this is Black Eyed Susans, and this is what you could plant with them that will look good with them. They grow well together, and so I'll be doing some videos on that as well, and maybe that'll help you too, along with some more videos like this. And if you guys uh, like this format, let me know. If you hate this format, let me know that too. Uh, but I'm Michelle. Hopefully you enjoyed today's video. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't, and thanks for watching. Keep on gardening. We'll see you in the next video. Bye, everybody.